What's going on everybody, C4 here, and we are continuing with our 32 team 7 round mock draft with today, pick number 5, Denver Broncos, very interesting spot for them to be selecting, I feel like I might catch some heat, I feel, I feel like it's where they're going to select at 5 is pretty polarizing amongst Denver Bronco fans, so I feel like I'm going to appease one side of the fan base and piss off the second side, so before we jump into the mock draft, we need to look at what they did in free agency to set up our board. Looking at what they brought back, they were able to re-sign Matt Paradis, who, you know, at points during his career has been a very good center. Uh, they put a tender and returned uh, Shaq Barrett, who is a nice little rotational edge rusher. Uh, they signed Case Keenum to be their starting quarterback this season. That is NFC Championship game Case Keenum with the Minnesota Vikings. And they were able to re-sign Todd Davis to be one of the starting inside linebackers there with Brandon Marshall. They lost by a trade, Aqib Tlaib, to the Rams. And they lost Virgil Green, the tight end. I believe he signed with the Chargers. So definitely, you look at that. I mean, Aqib Tlaib's a little surprising, but, you know, he's getting up there in age a little bit. And, um, you know, you, you got you got cover. You got Bradley Roby, who I think is ready to make the transition to start on the outside, along with Chris Harris. And you freed up some much-needed cap space to bring in Case Keenum. Why do you bring in a guy like Case Keenum? Because your plan is to draft a quarterback at five and use Case Keenum for, you know, just a year or two as the bridge QB. And with that being said, we're jumping to the mock draft at pick number five. We have the Denver Broncos selecting quarterback Josh Allen from Wyoming. Walk in, be quarterback two, learn and sit behind Case Keenum until he's ready. Now, when you look at Josh Allen, people, you know, there's red flags about his completion percentage and everything like that. But when you look at him as a prospect, not looking at the body of work, because you got to figure some of that completion percentage falls upon his team. He, he comes from a pretty terrible team. It's not like Carson Wentz, where he was in the end, uh, the Div, Div 2 or whatever they call it. And, you know, his team was the best. They're the powerhouse. They won five, six national titles in seven years. Wyoming is playing against a little bit better competition throughout the season. And you figure the talent around Josh Allen wasn't quite there. Now, I'm not completely excusing his low completion percentage because you watch him play. He just has that Jamarcus Russell arm and you see the completion numbers being where it is. Fine. It is, you know, you can bring up those red flags, but you look at how well he threw at the combine. He didn't really threw as good as any quarterback at the combine. He looked dominant in the senior bowl, especially in the second half. He was pretty much lights out. And we look at him as an athlete. He's pretty much a carbon copy of Carson Wentz. Now, when you look at Carson Wentz in the NFL, his first year was kind of shaky. We Our plan was with Philadelphia to have Sam Bradford start and, you know, have basically Carson Wentz sit for a year and then look at 2018 and see what happens because that big year of development. Well, we ended up, you know, once we found out we can get a first-round draft pick from the Vikings and fleece the Minnesota Vikings with for Sam Bradford, we had to kind of throw Carson Wentz to the Wolves. And during that first year of development that everyone knew he needed, we saw him in year number two be, if he didn't get hurt, he probably would end up being the MVP. Now, I'm not saying that Josh Allen is going to be able to follow that. Josh Allen is not as good as Carson. He's not even really in the same category as Carson Wentz was coming out of North Dakota State. I don't think any quarterback, maybe Josh Rosen in this year's draft class in terms of, you know, next level intangibles is there right now. But in terms of an upside, sure, Josh Allen with the athletic ability has the upside to be a Carson Wentz. And he's going to get the luxury with Case Keenum being there of not getting thrown to the Wolves first year like Carson Wentz. He's going to be able to sit. He's going to be able to learn. He's going to be able to develop. And if it's a little bit longer of a process, you could still ride Case Keenum into that second year, into the 2019 season. Case Keenum is a capable quarterback. Case Keenum with the weapons that they have on offense, be it Emmanuel Sanders, Demarius Thomas, C.J. Anderson for a year, even though for some reason it doesn't look like they value him whatsoever. He could, he could get this Denver Broncos team in the playoffs. They can still win with Case Keenum, but now they have the asset known as Josh Allen waiting in the wings. And really, with the quarterback contracts and understanding that when you get a quarterback, you know, you have that small window of contract flexibility where you're not paying him a whole lot of money and you can allocate it to other positions, you probably don't want Josh Allen sitting for more than a year. But I, I think that, you know, going for the 2019 season, he should be ready to go. Just have him, you know, sit behind Case Keenum and learn year one. I like Josh Allen a lot more than other people, I'll tell you that. Uh, just don't throw him to the Wolves. If you throw him to the Wolves, you know, he needs time to work on his footwork and work on his accuracy. He can do that. But, you know, you're not going to get that if you throw him to the Wolves and rush him right away to start as a rookie. Moving on to the second round, pick number 40. Ooh, maybe another hot take. I was selecting offensive tackle Orlando Brown from Oklahoma. Now, Orlando Brown had one of the worst combines in NFL history. Um, but at his pro day, he definitely improved all his numbers. If his numbers from the pro day happened in the combine, it still would have been viewed as a bad combine, but it wouldn't be reviewed as an all-time bad combine. I'd say, like, in terms of big-name prospects who've fallen flat at the scouting combine, 
Like, it's right up there with, like, a Vontez Perfect when he was coming out of uh, Arizona State when he ran his... I don't know if he was at the Combine or the Pro Day, but either way, one of those numbers was absolutely horrific. And that's just the first thing that pops up the board. But, you know, say if Orlando Brown had smarter management, had a smarter agent or smarter coaches that say, hey, don't work out at the at the Combine, just, just go to the draft. Looking at the tape... He was regarded as a top three tackle in this year's draft class. And the tape still stands. Sure, athletically, he has to grow into his body. You know, that that's what happens when you move to the NFL and get on that strength and conditioning program. There's a little bit of a learning curve. But as far as upside and just what he can do right now, he probably still could start in the NFL. As if King Dunlap can start for the San Diego Chargers, there is no doubt in my mind that Orlando Brown, as a rookie as is, just being with that size and having a pretty decent football IQ, could start at right tackle. And when you look at the Denver Broncos, their offensive line needs to get better. When you look at what they have, they have Ron Leary, you have Matt Paradis, who's kind of inconsistent, but you would say you could pencil him in as a starter, and you have Garrett Bowles. Outside of that, you definitely need another guard, you definitely need another tackle, and I ultimately think Orlando Brown will, you know, it will die down how bad his combine was. You must as you look at the tape, you guys see a guy that was able to protect well for Baker Mayfield, run block well, consistent on that front with a high ceiling. I think if you're the Denver Broncos, you take a gamble here on Orlando Brown and try to get a future tackle, you know? And with his size, you know, he maybe you start him out at right tackle, keep Bowles at left, but I think eventually Garrett Bowles, you make that little switch. You make that switch. You put Garrett Bowles at right, and then once Orlando Brown, maybe year two, you can slide him to left. You got two tackles in place. For your future franchise quarterback, you hope, in Josh Allen. Going into the third round where they have two picks. First pick at 71, I was selecting offensive guard Braden Smith from Auburn. I think right away, again, I'm trying to shore up that offensive line. He could come in and compete for that left guard spot with my boy from Florida, Max Garcia. Braden Smith putting up massive numbers on the bench press, 34 or 36, somewhere in that range. And his tape looked really, really good for me, to be completely honest with you. With his size, too, you may be able to have some flexibility and, and just practice him at tackle. He has the length, he has the reach, kind of like Brandon Linder a little bit for an interior your offensive lineman that's very very big it'd be intriguing to play him as a tackle but he is pretty much right now an out out guard because that's where he played at auburn blocking for carry on johnson and you know, he was a mauler he's an absolute mauler just your big type guy that i think that could compete for left guard and the fact that you get that kind of value in the third round for a team that needs to get better on the offensive line i think you need to jump on that opportunity with back-to-back -back picks to sure up that o-line Going into the second pick in the third round, 99 out of selecting defensive end Jalen Hones from Ohio State. Considering Adam Goetz has had that off-the-field altercation, he might not be back on the roster. That defensive end spot's looking pretty thin. Kind of surprised they haven't moved Demarcus Walker there to defensive end, according to our lads, which is what I'm using roughly for the depth chart. He's behind uh, Von Miller as a you know the, the outside linebacker, edge rusher kind of role. But Jalen Holmes definitely has the frame to bulk up to be a rotational 3-4 defensive end earlier on in his career, and eventually maybe be a starter. He has that kind of seeing that kind of potential and when you look at the defensive front here for the Denver Broncos you know good at run, stopping the run not so good at putting pressure on opposing teams quarterback they need to find that from the front and not rely surely and solely on Von Miller being able to get home and occasionally Shane Ray so I think a guy like Jalen Holmes is definitely worth the investment here in the third round Going to the fourth round, 106. We're looking at nose tackle Kendrick Norton from Miami. I think he could come in right behind uh, Pecco, who's been pretty solid last year. But again, remember, he's plus 30. You know, he's up there in age, you, and I don't really see a clear replacement beyond him. So thinking forward, get a guy like Kendrick Norton here in the mid-rounds that, you know, if all things go well, he can develop. And then looking at 2019, be that new starter at nose tackle. You got to find, you know, the eventual replacement there for Pecco. I think a guy like Kendrick Norton, who uh, looked really, really good for the U for most of the season when they were riding high, uh, he would be a very good investment there. Going to their second fourth round pick, 109. I was selecting running back Carrion Johnson from Auburn. You know, you got Braden Smith, why not get his running back? Now, this is where it comes a little confusing for me because I really do think C.J. Anderson is one of the most underrated running backs in football, but it just seems like the Denver Broncos will never commit to him. And when you look at Devontae Booker, you see a guy like, yeah, is he special? No, is he going to be anything... I really feel like if they thought Devontae Booker could eventually be that guy, they wouldn't have brought in Jamal Charles, which they did last year. And even Booker's limited time, he's not bad, but he's just average. So if the future doesn't really have C.J. Anderson in their plans, they're just going to hold on to him this year. Might as well get a guy in the fourth round that has a chance of being the Alvin Kamara, Kareem Hunt value pick. And that is very much Carry On Johnson. Now, Carry On Johnson didn't test very well. He has an injury history, which is why he's not going to be going in the second or third round, which is where his talent 
based off of last year for Auburn, could play some, but here in the fourth round, that is definitely an easy investment for me to make, especially, you know, if I'm John Elway, and I don't really think that C.J. Anderson's in our long-term plans, gambling on a guy like Carrion Johnson, who could very well be the next great mid-round steal running back, is kind of a no-brainer for me. Then again, I, I don't know why they're not committing to C.J. Anderson. I think he's really nice. I think he's, you know, his downs have been, I mean, he has had some injuries here and there, but I think his downs ultimately have been to a very poor Denver Broncos offensive line. But ultimately, we, you know, we are, we're trying to fix that with Orlando Brown and Braden Smith. I think on Johnson adding to that running back core here in the fourth round would be nice. Looking at the fifth round, 142, we have wide receiver Jordan Lasley from UCLA come in and be wide receiver four. Uh, some mock drafts have him a lot higher, but I don't think he tested very well. His tape was pretty good for Josh Rosen, pretty much his go-to target once tight end Caleb Wilson went down. And I think when you look at Lasley, he has some off the field, which is why I think he will slip a little bit. And obviously his combine wasn't spectacular. But looking at it from the Denver Broncos, him sitting here in the fifth round, you start to build up your wide receiver core beyond Demarius Thomas, beyond Emmanuel Sanders. Those guys are getting up there in age. And, you know, you got Carlos Henderson. Yeah, you know, you got uh, Benny Fowler. Yeah. You know, there's not, there's no one really there behind your two big old dogs that are still serviceable. So now it's start to start the time to, you know, plan for life beyond them. I think uh, getting a, a, you know, a nice little value pick here in Jordan Lasley would be good for their depth chart and good for the future. Look at their second, fifth round pick, 163. I have them going running back, but more offensive weapon. Naheem Hines from North Carolina State was one of the fastest 40-yard dash times at the Combine, and he plays everything. He plays running back, he plays special teams, punt returns, slot wide receiver. He's your gadget player. So when you look at someone like Isaiah McKenzie, who's pretty much, you know, their, their gadget-ish player that can, you know, do a little bit of punt returning and wide receiver, you kind of get all that and more in Naheem Hines. And when I look at the... You know, the Denver Broncos offense, I don't see a lot of explosiveness anymore because, you know, Demarius Thomas, Manuel Sanders are getting older. Their speed's starting to come down a little bit. So who is that absolute game changer, the game breaker on that offensive side of the ball? Don't see it right now. And you get a guy like Naheem Hines, plug him in. Versatile offensive weapon can move everywhere around the field and gives Case Keenum in particular some guy that he can just dump the ball off for and just watch him blow past a bunch of people. And the fact that you're getting that value in the fifth round to add a dimension to your offense, I think that is a good fit for the Denver Broncos. And finish up the mock in the sixth round, 182. I was selecting safety Trey Flowers from Oklahoma State. I think he could very well compete for the strong safety two position and special teams. The fact that he's a very, very big man at 6'3", ran the 4'4", 40s, great spies, great speed. That's gunner ability. You know, you, you get penciled into that, you know, uh, Taylor Mays role. Like, worst case scenario, your safety, that we're going to get special teams ability. And that's pretty much all you can ask for in the 6th and 7th round is get guys that can crack the 53, play some special teams, and potentially add some depth. And I think he might be able to bring that behind Justin Simmons at the strong safety spot. So there you go, guys. Lots of draft picks to talk about here for Denver. Hopefully, you Bronco fans are, are you feeling it. You're digging it. You're liking my approach. Let me know in the comment section below if you agree or disagree with any of my picks. As well, if you're a Broncos fan, give me your Denver Broncos mock. See how it lines up. If it's your first time stopping by, don't be afraid to hit that subscribe button. And until next time, it's C4 saying peace out.